Okay, and we're welcome. back. Welcome, welcome back. Part two. Short break is over, uh, and we're ready to. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What was that? Those of you that watched part one probably noticed this sexy hat that Cat was wearing. Yes, you guys have been on us for a while, and. We now officially have some merch in. We have a whole line of hats, caps, lids, whatever you want to call them. They are coming to a standingstonekennels.com slash store near you. <laughs> that was that was awesome. Uh, these are the first ones that are out. So they will be on our store and available for purchase and shipping out tomorrow. Tomorrow. The Murica lid. It's got a beautiful hat. Uh, excuse me. A beautiful patch flag. It's got the roguelet up there and stars and stripes and, uh, or just stars, I guess. But then, uh, it's a, it's a blue mesh back, beautiful gray front. This thing is sexy and cat makes it look as such. And there is a back that says standing stone. It's a standing stone. Just so you know, you're representing. And just so you know, I'm not taking this hat off because I've had hair. It's It's horrible. It's terrible. All right, so I have a very interesting thing that happened recently, and I want to talk about it. Because we get a lot of questions a about ton of questions. puppy biting. Puppy biting is a, is a very common thing. It's a very natural thing, and it is a thing that a lot of people are struggling with. Because puppies bite. They have sharp they teeth. Do. They explore their world with their mouth, so it's natural mm-hmm. and normal for them to bite. Mm-hmm. But, but sometimes the biting gets out of control and we, a while back, for those of you that are, um, loyal followers or subscribers, those of you that are just tuning in for the first time, definitely hit that subscribe button because it's uh, important to us. So those of you that are subscribing, subscribing probably already have watched this and we specifically said, Hey, if you've got puppy biters, or I said, there's no, there's no we. It's usually me making these outlandish comments of, hey, if you've got puppy biters, bring them to the kennel and we'll help you. Um, somebody took us up on that. And their puppy biting wasn't quite as described. Um, it wasn't... Wasn't as expected, I suppose. It 100% caught me off guard. And it was a once in a ever situation for me. We have a 16-week-old puppy. Yes. 16 weeks, cute as a button, sweet little girl, bird drive, intelligence, very willing to work, cooperative, all of the Tons things. Tons of basic obedience already. Also independence, which is a big part of being a bird dog, but cooperative for the session. I mean, doing all of the things that you would expect a well-rounded 16-week-old puppy to do. And I said, hmm, where is this uh, biting at? And I said, well, it's typically it's around nail trimming. That's what we're really, really struggling with. We start nail trims and we're to the point where we've pretty much just have to pin her down and try and trim them. And I was like, yeah, okay. I've worked with some puppies. We can work through this. I'd be happy to help you. So we sit down. I have my tools ready. I've got my clippers and my Dremel so we can work through the session. And it didn't go as I expected it would, which is not something that happens. It's not something that happens at this stage in the game very often. I usually have a pretty good idea of how things are going to go based on reading the dog and their behaviors and their reactions to different micro tests that I can do just. And you did take some time to build some rapport with her. It wasn't just like, I jumped this dog right out of the truck. Here's this brand new 16 week old puppy. Wham, bam. Here you go, ma'am. I'm going to, pin you down and trim your nails. No, worked with her through some training sessions, did some consult stuff. Mm-hmm. And then the through the course of the conversation and everything working with her, it got brought up, hey, this is where we struggle is with the nail trimming. And so at the end of the situation, it was, well, let's go and work through We've that We've spent now. enough time. She should be tired, which is a great time to start um, working through behavioral things like that. And, and so she has some trust for you now. Yeah. We built some rapport. We got to play with birds. That was exciting. And, um, uh, I felt good about it. So sat down with her and I started with, 
I'm going to just help you slowly roll over onto your back in my lap. And that's where we're going to begin getting you comfortable and moving into a nail trim. And I rolled her over onto her back and I got her kind of half situated. And the next thing that I knew, I had a puppy latched onto my arm. And I'm not kidding. It was 100% attached. Uh, not your typical puppy biting. This was her way of saying, do not touch me this way. I know what is coming. I do not want it. I do not want to deal with this. And it has worked for me in the past, so I will try and bite you. So we spent the next approximately hour and a half working through a session where um, basically I, I spent an hour and a half holding her. Um, I did get her nails trimmed. I did get her nails ground just a little bit, you know, I mean, just to get used to that process. And um, every time we did anything different, it was not squirming to get away. It was, I am going to show you that this is not okay. And this is not part of what I am okay with today. I mean, it was 100% defiance and 100% her way of communicating to say, leave me the beep alone. So, um, I turned the air conditioning down. Yep. I sat underneath the vent because it's easy to get worked up, to get warm, to get frustrated. And those are the situations that need the exact opposite of that. We have to be as 100% calm as possible so that we can really help the dog through that. But at the same time, be more stubborn than her in that situation. It was one of those things that as we worked through it, it took probably upwards of 20 minutes of restraining, basically, uh, before we could get to the point of trimming the first nail. And and restraining her so in a way that would prevent you from getting, getting a bit big more. Again. Yeah. Uh, we did try and you see. You can't if really see 100%, but like this hand took the brunt of it. It was like all over the place. And yeah. And. We did try and utilize a muzzle. Unfortunately, I just didn't have anyone small. We didn't have one small enough because typically, like you then said, we've never run into this with a 16 week old puppy before mm -hmm. necessarily needing a muzzle. Uh, some of the older dogs that come in for training, we utilize a muzzle, a muzzle for a couple of reasons. Yeah, it, it, that comes down to like bite force and things of that nature. You know, like if if a dog were to say because they are unsure of how to properly communicate, they were to say, Art, I don't want you to do that. It can cause some pretty dang serious damage with a mature dog. With a puppy, usually it just hurts. It's Their not. Teeth are like little needles though. They are like little needles and it definitely is not comfortable. It hurts a lot. Let me take a step back from that. I don't want to downplay this. It hurts a lot. But the, the difference is if you get bit by the bite, I mean, it'll be bruised for days and days and days. It's a pretty bad but deal. But the muzzle, what I was going to say, though, the muzzle is a good tool. People think, oh, muzzles are bad. Muzzles are scary for the dog. Muzzles, muzzles, muzzles have negative connotations. Well, the muzzles are a great way to not only protect the handler from getting bit terribly, uh, but it also teaches the dog that they can't bite this person that yeah. that that isn't an option. And so when it isn't an option, it makes that behavior go away, basically. The key in that process is to show them that the biting behavior, that biting desire or that attempt at saying, leave me the beep alone is not going to work. And in order to be able to show that it's not going to work, you have to be able to not move away, not pull away, not back off, not give in, um, you know, and there is, there is exceptions to every rule. I mean, you can push to the extent of causing a problem. Um, you have to take it at the dog's pace to an extent, but when that warning is given or that attack is made, we have to be able to say, I'm going to stand my ground. Um, and I'm not recommending that anybody here stand their ground with a dog and get bit, but um, when you have that muzzle on, you can do that and you can do that comfortably in a sense of and knowing safely. I'm not going to get bit. So I need to stand here. And if they try, it's one of those things that they can go, oh, 
that didn't get me the response that I want. And it also didn't turn ugly. You know, it's not a matter of they get disciplined from that. And I think a lot of behaviorists will talk about, you know, um, what would be the technical term of that? Just a correction based training for aggression is not the answer either. It's a lot of times it's just saying, look, this didn't work. And then they go, dogs understand very quickly. Oh, okay. I get it. I'm not, I'm not supposed to do that. Well, or they just understand, well, that didn't work. So maybe try something different. Yeah. Which could be to struggle to get away, which is drastically safer for us. And then when they realize that that doesn't work, then they go, maybe I should just stand here and, or lay here or whatever. And just give in. Yep. Just give in. And you know, that's going to be the best scenario in those situations. And it's best to start those things with puppies from day one. We do a slight, like a submissive hold drill. And that just says, roll over here, lay still. Oh, you want to fight a little bit? Okay. You're going to squirm and you're going to wriggle and you might scream bloody murder depending on the dog, but you have to have enough confidence in yourself to know that when I am holding this little wriggly puppy here, I'm not hurting them. You know, I have this bridge made. It just says, hey, don't move. And then they wiggle and fight and wiggle and wriggle and wriggle. And, and go, sometimes they get very <sighs> vocal and it's screaming and and complaining yep. and it sounds really bad because they are not happy with being restrained. And so they're trying to vocalize about it and it sounds really bad. And then people make the mistake of saying, because you love your puppy. Oh geez. Well, I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to scare him. I must be doing that. Yeah. No, your puppy's just vocalizing about it. Just like putting them in a crate. Sometimes they say, I don't want to be here. I'm going to scream and cry about it. Well, they're not hurt. No, it's part of life. It's normal. They're trying to figure out a way to get what they want. Right. And this is, being able to restrain a puppy and handle a puppy and work through things with a puppy is so important because you're going to have vet visits. You're going to have situations where your hunting dog gets hurt, running through a barbed wire fence, getting into a porcupine, any number of things that they're hurt, getting caught in a trap and you are there to help them and you don't want them lashing out and viciously biting and attacking you in the process of trying to help them. So, We worked through this and it took a while. And the key and the thing that we were looking for is before I could trim each nail, I needed her to understand that she was going to have to lay there and she was going to have to do it respectfully. If she tried to lash out or anything else to try and get out of the situation, I would stop the trimming aspect of things and not like that work to get me out of it. It was just, we're going to hold you here and we're going to wait. And once you're behaving, then we'll trim a nail. And Get to the point where she went from her initial move was to come after me to her next move was to vocalize and to maybe mouth in my direction and go, yeah, that didn't work and it's not ideal and it's not what I'm supposed to be doing. She was making better choices. She started to make better choices and that took within the first 30 minutes, she started to make better choices and then it continued to work and even though she was making better choices... Um, she still was struggling and fighting and trying to get out of it. And so we took the time, which is what we always preach. Make sure that when you're working through these drills that you, you have the time to work through it because you don't want to give in. You don't want to cut it short. You don't want to give up on it. You want to be able to work through it. And we did. It took a long time. We worked through it. She laid respectfully and calmly for each nail that was trimmed and then repeated that process for each nail that was lightly ground all the way around. We desensitized her to the grinder itself. She struggled with that a bit. And basically, um, I show how to do this in a a video that'll be coming out soon with Thunder, but basically touching the handle portion of the Dremel to her pad just to feel the vibration and learn to get over that and not have this big freak out about that as well. But working through all of those things, and then once it was all done, It helped her to relax and basically waited for that feeling that I got from her while I was holding her to say, good, she's given up, she's given in, she's relaxed. I said, okay, you can get up. And talking with the the family afterward, you know, it was brought to our attention. They said, after seeing how you handle her, we tried some of those things, but her reaction gave us the impression that we were hurting her or we were doing something that wasn't okay. And then we let her up. 
So she, they said, well, we probably created where she's at today. I said, well, possibly. Every dog is predisposed to be something. And most dogs are, are going to show their true colors through development. And we can aid or deter good and bad things from happening. But ultimately, they are what they are. And it doesn't take much for them to exponentially get better at whatever they're naturally going to be. Um, and the same thing can be in the opposite respect. So having good timing, feeling confident and comfortable in what you're doing and reaching out when you don't is the, the moral of the story. So, um, it was a surprising event. I wish we'd had the opportunity to video it. Um, but we didn't truly expect that this was what it was going to be about. So I wasn't prepared, but, and um, then we, we always have that thought in the back of our mind that the internet might not truly be prepared for what that looks like because it didn't, it didn't look, look good. good. No. It didn't look good. I'm I'm literally all I'm doing is holding this puppy here and she is screaming bloody murder, trying to get a hold of me in any way, shape, or form. And um taken out of context, people it, would look at that that it looks bad. You were truly hurting her, which all things considered, it was the complete opposite. I mean, she had already bit you multiple times yeah. and you were just trying to Restrain her with enough force to keep her from being able to get away. bite you again yep. and get and, away and bite me again, yeah, and and not hurt her. Um, but she, it didn't look like an enjoyable process for for you or for her. And no, I'm and she was severely stressed out during the process, and we talk about this a lot during our training. Um, that stress is a very important part of growth, and um, but within reason, right? So there is stress. Uh, you. You talk about what a working muscles and bodybuilding and lifting weights and exercising. Um, when you exercise, you push to the point of stressing your body. If you push too far, your body breaks. If you don't push far enough, your body doesn't grow. So stress is a, is a very important part of dog training. And the appropriate amount of stress is where we try and float in that window. And I mean, she was on the top end of that, but a lot of that stress was all caused by her um, pushing back, you know, and all we did was showed how she can have a less stressful training situation in the future. Yep. We start that stressing process, even with our biosensor training with the puppies, 100%. we do slight mild stressing positions. We put these puppies in that they don't find in nature, um, for very short amount of time, like five seconds. And there's only five different positions that we put them in. And those mild stresses are going to build stronger cardiac systems, stronger adrenal systems, stronger, uh, immune systems that are ultimately going to build stronger puppies overall. Now, if we push those baby stressors on the babies too far, we can cause permanent damage and break things. You know, I mean, it's the, the same concept, you know, yeah. you stress them out too much, they can get overstressed and it could cause a number of different issues, which is why it's very important to follow the specific rules of just a few seconds in all of the different positions. So any of you guys that are struggling with puppy biting, know that you are not alone. Definitely reach out to us. And a great place to do that is patreon.com slash standing stone kennels. Now, I believe we do have time for one really good question. I know you got one lined up there. Oh, man. I better quick get one. Quick get one. <laughs> okay. This one is from... Nicole Bishop, my husband and I love watching your videos and they are so helpful for us when it comes to training our dogs. Oh, well, thanks for watching. Yes. We are wondering what is the best way to handle keeping a female dog that's in heat away from our male dog? We okay. understand keeping them separate, but they're in the yard and the house together. And when the time comes, can we even leave them out of our sight? Also, what are some of the signs to look for to know when your female GSP is in heat? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, if both of your dogs are intact, um, he is going to be the, the, one of the fastest signs to know that she is in heat or coming into heat soon. He's going to start sniffing her and bothering her in a way that and you've never seen before. And getting kind of excited and worked up and a yep. little more amped up. He is. The, the good thing about that is the actual fertile period is not until somewhere between day seven and 21 ish, depending on the dog. So you have a little bit of time as long as you're paying attention on a regular basis to your dogs. And so, them living in the house with you, it's going to be difficult. Pretty easy. 
Yeah, it's going well, to be difficult, difficult to, miss. to miss. Pretty easy to find. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so him being a first sign, another thing that we notice with our females, because we also watch very closely because tracking heat cycles is important to a breeding, a breeding program. program. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll see little pimples show up on the vulva of the female a lot it's of times. It's a sign of increased hormones yep. flowing. And then there's some swelling involved as well in the vulva, um, as well as uh, first sign of blood usually is pretty light. Um, and then by day two, it's darkened up quite a bit. So um, I would gotten say that. Red, gotten yeah, redder, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. So the the actual amount of discharge is low. But the color is typically pretty dark, almost looks black sometimes. And that's usually you're like right at day zero. Um, and then within a day, like Kat's saying, it turns redder and the flow is going to increase to the point where they're bleeding everywhere. And depending on the dog, sometimes it's like blood. It looks like a horror scene everywhere they go. There's just blood everywhere. But some dogs are very, very clean mm-hmm. um, and they pool so they aren't dripping blood everywhere. And so it's easier to miss like day one or day two. And then you'll be like, is that a drop of blood yeah if, if you notice your dog swelling a little bit take a clean white paper towel and just wipe them if there's any color at all that resembles brown to red pink something then um you either have some kind of serious uti that's ble- bleeding but more likely than not your dog's in heat and the question about do you have to, to do? watch well have to watch them can they be out of your sight at all dogs can when get they're in bread heat. Yes, dogs no. can get bred very quickly. It does not take long for them to be out of sight and boom, they're tied. The experienced boys that we have downstairs in the right situation, I mean, we're in and out in less than 25, 30 seconds. And well, not in and out. We're in and done in 25, 30 seconds and then tied for 10 to 20 minutes, uh, depending on the situation. But it doesn't take any time at all. I mean, it is done. Yep. And then they're bred. And then you have to go, okay, are we going to have a litter of puppies off of this tie or are we not? So constant supervision, keeping them completely separate. 100% um, separate. Com- completely, 100% separate. And then um, even as much as crating them separately, we actually have people that we know that their male intact dog was just kept in another room from their female. And, and he, he dug through the whole, sheetrock yep. wall into the other room to get her bread. And then they had a litter of puppies. So yep, he, he dug a hole through the wall to get out of the laundry room or whatever room that he was kept in separately to get to her and breed her. So... That drive, and he was not a not a stud dog. He was Brings not. A whole new that was his to chase first. Tail. Yeah, that was his <laughs> first breeding ever. It wasn't intentional. Um, he wasn't an experienced stud. It's just natural desire and drive makes these dogs do these things. They get crazy, and so he. Uh, and if you have the option to have one, the, the male typically, because it's not the one bleeding all over the place, but you say, hey, um, friend that likes dogs, can you watch our male for the two to three weeks that four weeks, maybe depending on the female is she's in heat. It's a, it's a safer bed in the long We actually also have clients on. that say, hey, can I book a spot for my dog to come in for training? While she's in heat. While she's in heat or Mm -hmm. uh, for my male to come in for training while my female's in heat so that I don't have to deal with this. And then, you know, we keep them for a couple months, work on some things that they want worked on, and then they don't have to deal with that. And then if they aren't planning on doing any breedings after that first heat cycle, they plan on getting their female spayed and then they don't have to worry about dogs digging through walls and other (laughs) craziness happening. But I will say that was the uh, creation of a, a very nice dog that is now a Uper native. So that's all we're saying. Yeah. Well, that whole situation ended up leading us to very good friends, which we may or may not have met otherwise. So 100%. things sometimes happen for a reason. Thank but- goodness for the crazy wall eaters. <laughs> right? Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for the questions. Sorry we were only able to get to one, but we had a really good story and situation that we wanted to share that we thought would be very educational, which is all that we're trying to really do with these Yawas. Absolutely. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back soon with part three.